I've talked to several players who played in both leagues. Um, and then I specifically asked them, it's okay. When you talk about the national football league, the talent that's in the national football league and the talent that's in the all American football conference, how would you compare it? I mean, which team was, which league was stronger? Every single one of them said that the AAFC was at least as strong as the NFL, if not stronger. There's only one person that I know of that I've interviewed that said, well, that's true to some extent, but the worst teams in the AAFC were worse than the worst teams in the NFL. But he immediately followed that up and said, but the best teams in the All-America Football Conference were better than the best teams in the NFL. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Ah, yes, the dulcet tones of Corey Coates. Thank you very much, Corey, for your introduction. As always, my name's Tim Hanlon, and this is Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Today, we're talking about pro football and uh, the uh, topic in particular uh, is a league that ran in the uh, late 1940s that uh, has uh, still some very lasting uh, legacy effects in today's modern day uh, NFL. Uh, Ken Crippen is our guest. He is the president of the Professional Football Researchers Association, otherwise known as the PFRA, and uh, is probably uh, arguably the national specialist uh, in all things AAFC, All-America Football Conference. And that is the uh, topic that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Ken is uh, in the midst of authoring uh, a new book called The All-America Football Conference, Players, Coaches, Records, Games, and Awards. Uh, And it is published by McFarland. It is coming out in September uh, of this year. We're recording this in uh, late June, early July. Uh, But it is available for pre-order on Amazon or wherever you pre-order good books. And I encourage you to do so, and hopefully a good hour and change of conversation will encourage you to pre-order the All-America Football Conference book uh, authored by Ken Crippen with his co-author, by the way, Matt Reeser, again, available for pre-order on Amazon and wherever you pre-order stuff. Ken is also, as we'll talk about, uh, uh, authored a book that is currently available. Uh, It's called The Original Buffalo Bills, which is a history of the All-America Football Conference team known as the Buffalo Bills, and there's an interesting history behind that as well. Uh, that is also published by McFarlane uh, and is available now wherever good books are sold. Uh, so our conversation with Ken Crippen about the old AAFC uh, in the realm of pro football uh, in a couple of seconds. Uh, before we go any further, though, I do want to, uh, again, remind you that we are kindly sponsored by our friends at Audible. And I do want to uh, encourage you, if you haven't tried it yet, uh, what excuse are you waiting for aside from a free trial and a free uh, audiobook download from our friends at Audible, which is yours uh, for the trying at audibletrial.com slash goodseats, audibletrial.com slash goodseats, where you can get and enjoy and uh, trial uh, an Audible book, a free audio book, uh, and a 30-day free trial of the Audible audiobook service. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks, as you know, with over 180,000 titles in just about every genre uh, you can think of. Uh, in book land. Uh, It's thrillers and romance and comedy and sci-fi and business and nonfiction and fiction and you name it, Audible uh, not only has it, but probably a a plentitude of it. Uh, Audible titles play on just about every device that you can think of, whether it's an iPhone or a Kindle or an Android-based device, uh, 500 or so, actually more than 500 devices uh, that uh, basically ensure that you're going to be able to listen to any audiobook that you have from Audible anytime and anywhere. Again, audibletrial.com slash good seats. If you want a free 30 day trial of audibles, uh, audibles, if you will, services, uh, it, which, uh, specifically includes a free audiobook download for you to try and enjoy. Uh, I love the service. Uh, you've heard me talk about it, uh, uh, incessantly, and I encourage you to give it a try audibletrial.com slash good seats. Uh, and it's also a great way to show your support for the show. Um, we thank you, uh, audible, and we thank you for also considering, uh, and hopefully trialing the service for yourself. Okay, so uh, let's not waste any more time. Let's get to our conversation about the All-America Football Conference uh, with the esteemed author and uh, arguably the probably the um, uh, person most knowledgeable about the topic of the AAFC. His name is Ken Crippen here on the podcast. (laughs) 
Okay, so let's get sort of sort of the beginning parts of it, right? So how did this All America Football Conference thing kind of get going and get started? Obviously, the NFL was around, right? And it survived, uh, and not necessarily in the strongest manner. Uh, the uh, the World War that had just com- basically been uh, completed. Um, can maybe you can give our audience a bit of a, a background as to like how what the seeds of this conference uh starting uh were like at that time circa 45 46 well um you can kind of go back to about 1944 i mean there were two teams in buffalo a team in los angeles and a team in san francisco that were looking to get nfl franchises and they were going through the process the one team in buffalo was pretty much eliminated pretty quick because it wasn't you know as strong of a group so you had the sam cordovano group that was with um, Buffalo, you had the Bing Crosby, Don Amici group in Los Angeles, and then you had the Tony Morbido group in San Francisco. So they were the serious contenders to become franchises within the National Football League. But after going through the process, the NFL decided to reject all three of those uh, franchise requests. Uh, at the same time, Arch Ward, uh, he was a sports editor in Chicago, um, he decided he wanted to start up his own league. And when he saw that those three groups were rejected by the NFL, he immediately approached them and they became, you know, one of the three charter members of the all America football conference. Um, so that's kind of how that started. There were several other minor league, um, trying to start up at that time. I think there's a total of about five or six. Uh, that were trying to get established at that time, but they all pretty much fell away because Either there wasn't enough backing, there wasn't enough interest, they couldn't get enough owners, whatever the case may be. So it really came down to just the All-America Football Conference starting up against the uh, the National Football League. You were mentioning about the war, and then, you know, in 1946, you know, you had a lot of people coming back from the war. So um, the struggles that the NFL was going through as far as having enough players to field teams, that was starting to go away a little bit, and that allowed the All-America Football Conference to also have access to more people as they were coming back from uh, serving overseas. So that gave enough talent to be able to have two leagues at the same time. Uh, But really, there wasn't enough to be able to have anything more than two leagues at the same time. So that's another reason why some of the other ones um, kind of fell by the wayside as they were trying to compete against the NFL. Well, we've we've done a couple of episodes already on uh, the Steagles, right? That sort of one year sort of mashup of the uh, of the Eagles and the Steelers, right, to survive the war. And we, we had another episode uh, with mm-hmm. uh, Jim Selecki around the Cleveland Rams, uh, and they, you know, obviously survived uh, enough to win a championship and then bolt bolt for Los Angeles. Um so I guess my question would be, why would there be three and, and obviously some some real money behind them groups that would actually be interested in, in forming, I guess, NFL franchises? I mean, did they sort of see the the brush clearing, so to speak, since the, the, the war had ended, that the opportunities were there? Or I mean, it seems like maybe a bit of a folly to think that they could immediately expand so quickly, given how the league kind of limped through uh, and survived through the war. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if they were considering themselves, um, you know, financially viable enough um, or more viable than the existing NFL franchises. I mean, I think they were looking at it as the fact that, okay, you know, we've got money, we've got name recognition, especially when you're looking at the Los Angeles group with Don Amici and Bing Crosby and, and people like that, that they figured that, okay, well, even if the NFL is struggling, uh, we could probably bring more revenue in because, you know, we're now expanding it out onto the West Coast with San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, we've got, you know, name recognition here. So we think that, you know, they they could definitely help out the league. Uh, they could see that, you know, even in 1944, you know, I mean, they were struggling a little bit, but yet things were starting to come back a little bit more. It was a little bit earlier uh, when you start seeing, you know, the teams having to combine themselves together in order to, to just stay afloat. But as you're getting farther along at 45 and stuff like that, then, you know, they start seeing that, okay, now they, it is going to be able to survive this war and we're going to be able to you know, keep it viable going forward. So I think that they saw that, you know, they could contribute to the league uh, and still be able to keep everything going um, forward, even though the war was still going on at that time. 
Why do you think the NFL said no then? I mean, it would seem like that would be a welcome opportunity to somewhat immediately grow and and stabilize even further the league. Um, why would they say no to three interested and well well moneyed uh, opportunities to to grow and expand? Um, I think that they were still a little leery about being able to sustain themselves. So I think adding more franchises in there was something they were a little nervous about. And especially, you know, you're looking at multiple franchises over on the West Coast. And I think that's one of the main things that they were struggling with is, okay, now you've got all these added travel costs and, you know, you're going to have restrictions um, because of the war going on. So it was going to make it really difficult for them to financially justify doing that. Uh, I think the reason why they rejected Buffalo was more of the fact that it was a small market. Uh, they didn't think they were going to get enough revenue out of it. I mean, if it was, say, you know, adding a team in um, a well-established city, that's one thing. But, you know, with a smaller city like that and the fact that Buffalo had struggled previously to keep a team afloat, I think um, the combination of all those reasons is why the, the NFL rejected them and said, you know, maybe some other time we'll let you in. But as of right now, uh, we're not going to let you in. It's very interesting because it's a uh, it's, it's a theme. We've uh, we uh, talked at length with our friend uh, Michael McCambridge about the uh, AFL and Lamar Hunt and the reason that the uh, I guess it was the third the third iteration of the AFL, but the the American Football League of the '60s itself was uh, spurred on by a rebuff by the uh, the gentlemen's club, shall we say, of the NFL, saying no to other similar uh, expansionist slash enthusiasts. Um, so it's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's, it seems like the NFL way back when uh, is was still very much this sort of uh, closed and clubby environment that uh, uh, was resistant uh, to many people sort of knocking on the door from the outside. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, you know, you could probably see coming out of the 1920s. I mean, they, there was a lot of expansion. They had a lot of teams come in. Uh, it was pretty loose back then. So um there were multiple times when the, the league and the teams themselves um, either barely went bankrupt or did go bankrupt. I mean, the NFL did survive, but um, a lot of the leagues were, a lot of the teams were folding up. So I think they may have just been a little gun shy with that as far as, um, you know, we got to be careful when we expand. We got to make sure we have good, solid teams because, you know, we're struggling as it is. By adding more, it's going to make it even worse. So they want to make sure that um, they make the right decisions going forward. So I think, you know, coming out of the 1920s um, and seeing what was happening like early 40s, you know, into the mid 40s with the war going on, that they needed to be careful as far as who they let in and didn't want to just let anybody in. They wanted to make sure that they were going to be strong, they were going to be viable and that they weren't going to hurt the league in any way. All right, let's talk about this guy, Arch Ward, right? Because he's obviously the genesis of, of this this challenger league. Um, you mentioned he was a writer. Obviously, he was a, well, not so obviously. I, my, uh, my research shows that he was a, uh, uh, a well-known sports editor at the Chicago Tribune back when the Chicago Tribune was a, a, a viable uh, and, uh, and, and robust uh, uh, newspaper, which is more of an indication of, of where journalism is going these days. But uh, I digress. Um, h- how did uh, a, a guy like Ward... Um, sort of get any kind of credibility to even broach this idea aside from a, being, you know, a columnist and, and saying so in print to get a league going? Uh, well, he was um, the one who established the college all-star game um, between the, the college um, the, and uh, you know, the college winners and the uh, all-stars within uh, professional football. So, Starting that off, you know, they showed that he could organize things. Um, he had contacts, and so he was able to, you know, get people interested in forming a league. Um, you know, having those contacts and showing that, you know, he's a, a serious person when it comes to putting stuff like this together. I mean, to me, that is the reason why people were able to get on board with what he wanted to do as far as creating a competing league. Uh, he was also the originator of baseball's all-star game too. Is that true? Uh, I think so. I'm not uh, a baseball historian, so I don't know if I could really answer that question. All right, we, put, we put that but, out. Uh, to, it's we, possible that he did do that. We put that out to our completists out there. Um, so, okay. <laughs> so, but, but it's, it seems to me that Ward's original idea was to convince the NFL to expand and, and being rebuffed in, in either direct or indirect ways. 
Um, maybe you can kind of give us some sense as to how he went about to generate the group that became the AF, AAFC. Well, he, he had a few people already on board that were interested. And I think the main thing that pushed it over the edge and said, okay, yeah, this is going to be a viable uh, system that we're putting together, a viable conference or league, uh, is those three teams that were, were buff, rebuffed by the NFL. So once those three said that, yeah, we're on board with this All-America Football Conference, we're willing to go go ahead with you, I think that really gave it some, uh, it, it just made it uh, more solid as far as a, an idea and a concept. And now they know that, you know, we have some solid people here. We've got, you know, the financial backing and, you know, we've got some of the name recognition of some of these owners. So now we can, we're definitely going to be able to go ahead with this conference and, and it's going to be a, a viable alternative to the NFL. And I guess from a, using a PR flourish, I guess that Ward was probably very good at, right? He he chose his initial commissioner pretty wisely, didn't he? Yes, he did. Um, I think the, what he was really able to do is the fact that, you know, since he was the editor for the Chicago Tribune, he knew that he was going to get at least coverage within Chicago. I mean, that was pretty much a given since he controlled the, the newspaper and what was getting printed, so... He knew he was going to get the advertising, but then you start looking at you know, who he's bringing in, you know, like Jim Crowley, you know, of the Notre Dame, uh, the Four Horsemen. Uh, when you have somebody of that caliber coming into your league, that's also going to give a credibility because you know this guy was famous for being part of the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame, and you have that name recognition, then you know you're really going to be able to. Uh, to make some inroads and get some publicity uh, with this new league. But also a tweak at the NFL itself, right? Because the commissioner of the NFL at the time was another legendary Notre Dame guy by the name of Elmer Layden, uh, who was part of the Newt Rockney, you know, legendary teams of, of your and at Notre Dame too. Exactly. So they were basically teammates back at Notre Dame. And then now they're going to be going up against each other. Uh, NFL versus All America Football Conference. So yeah, you had an added storyline that uh, that creates more interest in this new league. So the NFL, right, uh, is certainly uh, ecstatic at the uh, at, at the arrival of a new challenger league, right? Oh yeah, yeah, they were uh, they were very happy about that. Um, yeah, they did everything they could to dismiss them uh, to try to uh, make sure that there's no way that they could get started. Uh, they were even threatening that they were going to blackball anybody who signed a contract with the All-America Football Conference, that there was no way you were ever going to play in the NFL again. Um, you know, every tactic that they could to minimize the league and to try to make sure that there was no way that this league could get started. Yeah, there's a famous quote. Uh, I don't know how, how ready, readily you have that available, but uh, Layden in particular was not necessarily uh, generous with his public uh, – uh, praise or endorsement of the challenger league. Yeah. Something along the lines of tell them to go get a ball or something like that. Um, yeah. Basically you know, he's minimizing saying that, yeah, there's, there's no way that this te- this conference is ever going to get, get started. Uh, there's no way they're going to be able to compete against the NFL. And even if they do, it's going to be, you know, a very minor league team. There's going to be no talent there. So there's really, you know, no point in even, acknowledging their existence is pretty much what he's trying to say. Well, but okay, so the NFL kind of, I guess, at least publicly took this sort of as a, ah, you know, uh, you know, l- let them let them have it. You know, uh, we've been through literally war uh, and we've survived and uh, and, and we're going to continue and, and do just fine. Thank you. Um, but mm-hmm. the, the reality, though, was in the beginning days, it, it was pretty it was pretty for, formidable in terms of the people and the uh, the talent uh, and uh, arguably some of the markets, uh, it seemed like there was some general and genuine enthusiasm for uh, for expanded football in these uh, in, in with this league, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the AFC definitely put franchises in the same regions as NFL franchises, and they knew that those cities could sustain football because they were doing that with the NFL. And they were going to be able to compete against the NFL, basically side by side with them. 
Um, so having these larger cities, having these established cities, um, they knew that they were going to be able to compete. You go into New York, you go into Cleveland, you go into Chicago, you go into you know Los Angeles. I mean, those are strong cities for football, and they knew that they were going to be able to sustain it. So, um, yeah, I mean, definitely the way that they positioned some of these franchises was to, to go directly at the NFL, and I think that definitely scared the NFL because – you're going to have to compete side by side with these teams and you're going to be competing for the same fan base. Um, so that definitely made them nervous. It seems too that the, uh, and I saw this quote, I don't know to whom it's attributed, but this, the AAF, the AAFC's ownership um, was dubbed the quote millionaires coffee clutch. And uh, it seems that the money behind these teams uh, and the source of the wealth behind the ownership of these teams was actually uh, greater than that of those of the NFL. I, I, is there any – I'm just curious as to sort of getting to the the source of wealth as being a potential real challenger and maybe why the NFL was so difficult in, in even acknowledging their existence because it seems like there's some really well-moneyed uh, backers to this challenger. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I would agree with that. I mean, there was, you know, some strong financial backing to this. Uh, the NFL was struggling financially. Some of their teams were on the verge of bankruptcy. Some were, you know, having to try to keep others afloat and keep the league afloat. So they were struggling. So now they see a lot of these people coming in that had money, you know, especially when you know, you look at the Don Amici's and the, the Bing Crosby's of the Los Angeles franchise. Um, you see the the money and the name recognition. And so that's definitely a threat for them. So by calling them the, the millionaire's coffee clutch, you know, the same as like, you know, calling the, the foolish club in the AFL. It's basically you know, a way to try to minimize it. This is just a hobby for these people. They're not serious. We're the real football people. Um, so, you know, ignore them doing their hobby and, you know, focus on the people who, who do this fine, you know, for a living type of a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, they were definitely struggling in the NFL financially. And, so, you know, if they had to go dollar for dollar with the all American football conference, you know, you're going to lose because you're just going to bankrupt basically both conferences. Uh, and I think they were really scared about that, that they wouldn't be able to financially survive doing that. Um, especially going through the war years. Yeah, I mean, it seems that uh, the source of the of the money from AAFC owners, I mean, you had, to, you know, Mickey McBride in Cleveland, who's a, a real estate and taxi, uh, you know, guy. You had uh, Tony Morabito in the lumber industry. You had uh, obviously that Los Angeles group of uh, entertainment uh, folks. I think I think Louis B. Mayer uh, from MGM was part of that. You had uh, John Keeshan in, in the trucking business in Chicago, you know, where whereas the NFL guys, right, the source of their sort of wealth. Uh, was really the teams themselves, um, you know, and arguably they had, you know, quite a bit of experience, right, running a league, right? So there's, there's certainly an intangible asset there. But, you know, when it comes to your point, you know, dollar for dollar um, in the beginning, and maybe this is in hindsight, uh, you look at it sort of longer term, uh, interested money sources from the outside, you know, uh, can't be ignored uh, probably for too long. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when you've got people who are successful in outside businesses and have other revenue streams coming in, uh, it makes it a lot easier for them to, to pour some extra money, and especially in the beginning, to try to compete and to make sure that you get the best talent. So, I mean, it was definitely a threat to the National Football League where not all of the owners had uh, successful businesses, you know, as a really good revenue stream coming in to be able to offset the losses of going against the All American Football Conference. All right, can you speak to how some of these teams kind of came into being uh, as the season started to to get going? Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, intrigue, say, in the New York market uh, even before the league got started. But maybe, you know, obviously, you've got some background and knowledge about Buffalo. Maybe you give some some uh, the audience a bit of a some understanding about how some of these teams came into being as the league got going. Well, in the beginning, um, there was actually a Buffalo or a Baltimore franchise that was supposed to start. They were going to be one of the original eight teams. But unfortunately, the uh, the person that was running that was called overseas, and so that team ended up folding. Uh, in its place came the Miami Seahawks franchise. Um, 
Buffalo was um, pretty pretty well established with Sam Cordovano. Uh, he, you know, was working on this for a long time. Like you know, I'd mentioned before that, you know, he started wanting to be in the NFL back in 1944, along with Los Angeles and San Francisco. So I mean, those three franchises, you know, had been working on this for a long time. Uh, Chicago uh, was coming into play. I mean, that was obviously going to be something that was a real focus of Arch Ward since, you know, he was from Chicago. Um, so each of those teams, you know, really, you know, they did start from the ground up, but some of them uh, did have, you know, a running start, so to say, with this, that um, they had been doing it for a while, and so they had some more structure in place. Um, as far as getting teams in New York, um, actually that was an interesting story because it started off with um, – Dan Topping in uh, in New York in Brooklyn, and you know he had a team in the National Football League, and he wanted to to move into the New York um, into a larger part of the New York market, and the, the NFL really was against doing that um, because they had you know another team there, the New York Giants, and so they wanted to keep things separate between the two, and Dan really wasn't wasn't happy with that, and. To kind of make a long story short on that, uh, he was a he basically gave up his franchise within the NFL because the AAFC was able to lure him into their conference, and so he gave up his franchise and then moved over into um, into the All American Football Conference in order to get the uh, the New York team that he wanted. So, I mean, that was definitely a, a huge coup for the All-America Football Conference to essentially steal a franchise from the NFL, not just stealing some players, but stealing an entire franchise from them. And and, and to back up, uh, Topping's uh, team in the NFL was known as the Brooklyn Tigers. Um, right. And uh, Brooklyn, obviously a, a, a fledgling market and a big market, but but he, I guess, saw that there were uh, a, there was a bigger metropolitan New York play, I guess, by – by bolting and, and trying to uh, get uh, into the, the drift, I guess, of the uh, the fledgling AAFC. Correct. Yeah, he basically wanted to be the New York Giants, you know, to, to get into that market uh, or at least that part of New York City. And obviously because of, you know, the Giants already being there, the NFL wasn't going to have two franchises within that same very small region. So he, he decided, you know, he was going to bolt over to the new league so that he could have that uh, that larger metropolitan area, as you mentioned, and, uh, and have that New York franchise that he was really looking for. My understanding is that Topping also uh, did some other sort of intriguing things in the background to sort of make that happen, including, from what I understand, was uh, buying a minority stake in the New York baseball Yankees to kind of grease the skids. Is that uh, part of the of the lore of this uh, the switch too? That is correct. I mean, he did uh, become a, a minority owner within the, the New York Yankees. And I think a lot of that was because he wanted to be able to use that stadium for his team. And so, you know, if he's part owner of that team, then he's going to have more of a, um, a vested interest and have more pull to be able to get his team into that larger stadium so he can bring in more revenue for his team. So I think it's important to understand Topping's role here uh, and this this uh, again, this is even before the league even even really sort of played it down uh, because the NFL owners apparently not happy with this move. And, and that already started to uh, some consternation within the ownership ranks of the NFL, right? That's correct. I mean, you had a couple of things going on at the same time I mean, you had Topping doing that. And then at the same time, which you know, I'm guessing we're going to be talking about this, about the Cleveland Rams moving out to Los Angeles. I mean, he he wanted to move. Um, uh, the the owner of the Rams wanted to move, and they were really against doing that, especially against you know where he wanted to go. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think he wanted to go down into the, the Texas area. He wasn't as interested in going out to Los Angeles, um, but they they said no, you you can't do that. And so you've got two disgruntled owners at the same time. Uh, you got one that ended up leaving, and then another one that, you know, he was able to move the team, uh, but he moved it out to Los Angeles, and that was more of a direct competition to the Los Angeles Dons and the All American Football Conference. Um, wasn't as happy about doing that, but, you know, 
when you have those two disgruntled owners in there, that definitely doesn't bode well for the league, and that created more problems than uh, than they were hoping to have at that time. Yeah, so uh, we we talked about that at length with uh, with Jim Selecki on our uh, Cleveland Rams uh, episode, and Dan Reeves, the owner of the Rams, right? Indeed, uh, it was ironic because they had just come off winning the. Uh, the NFL title and and, you know, frankly, had not been drawing all that well. It's just as ironic that Cleveland would be sort of this uh, uh, point of contention, given that the, uh, the the Rams were never truly a big draw, uh, despite winning the uh, the NFL championship. And and ironically, Los Angeles, uh, as time showed later on that, you know, probably a very, uh, uh, very valuable uh, move uh, uh, and, and and a rich one. Uh, for that team, at least in the in the in the near term, but it also feels to me that the All America Football Conference had maybe because of the money behind it and the people behind it a little bit more of a um, I don't know a national aspiration perhaps versus the NFL, which seemed to be more I don't know lack of a better word conservative or steady as she goes, especially having you know just survived the war. Yeah, and I think a lot of that was, you know, with the the travel costs. They thought it was going to be too difficult to start expanding out into the West Coast. Whereas, like you said, the All-America Football Conference wasn't as concerned with that. I mean, you saw that with them bringing in two teams on the West Coast. Uh, They figured, you know, okay, you've got the the natural rivalry, you know, between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, But then you've also are expanding things because now you're going all the way across the country. And, you know, the NFL was, like you said, trying to be a little more conservative because of those costs. They weren't ready to expand, but um, Dan Reeves pretty much forced their hand with it of saying he wanted to move his team. And so they said, okay, well, we're going to have to compete against this other league. So, you know, you're going to go out to Los Angeles and that's where you're going to get things established. We'll have the try to take stuff out of the uh, the market for the all America football conference. And, you know, that's now going to expand us out there, but yeah, they really didn't want to do that that quickly. They were hoping to keep things a little more localized, maybe just midway across the country and not go all the way out there uh, that quickly. Well, it's, it's also very interesting as these uh, teams came into play, we're talking about eight teams in the AAFC. Uh, you had two in New York, one, the New York Yankees, one, the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, or what was the remainder of the Brooklyn Dodgers since the, the switch to the New York Yankees team. You had a, a team in Buffalo that didn't have any competition uh, professionally. You had the Miami Seahawks, right, which was relatively uh, quickly born from Baltimore efforts. Um, you had uh, a team in Cleveland, right, the Browns, which we'll talk about in a second. You had uh, the L.A. Dons, which was now competing with the, the Rams of the NFL, right, so two teams in Los Angeles. And a and a virgin franchise, shall we say, in the in the 49ers of San Francisco. Um, but it's also really interesting, too, in that the Chicago team of the AAFC, right, the Chicago Rockets. And we talked about why Arch Ward, you know, would seem to be find that to be a, a, a an important perch for him being a Chicago Tribune guy. You already had two teams in Chicago in the NFL. So now you've got three teams competing professionally in Chicago. You know, it's so for for a league that seems to have national ambitions it seems like there was a lot of doubling down and in direct competition with the NFL, um, which even made it more bold and or questionable. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, especially the the Chicago team. I mean, yeah, I mean, Arch Ward definitely wanted to have a team that was local. But, you know, looking at it, you can say that, you know, there's two NFL teams already there. There's no way you're going to be able to sustain a, a third team in Chicago. And that pretty much, you know, pour itself out, you know, when you're looking at how well that team did and uh, the financial issues that they had. But yeah, I mean, you definitely wanted to to have that direct competition with the NFL by going into New York, by going into Los Angeles, um, Cleveland. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at the time, the Rams were still there. They were talking about leaving. So, I mean, there was going to be some, they thought was going to be some competition there, especially, you know, with the National Football League champion, as you had mentioned. But, uh, yeah, I think the main ones that they wanted to to target were New York and Los Angeles. And I think, you know, doing that was was really a a way for the AAFC to say, yeah, we're here, we're here to stay, and, you know, we're going to go compete against you directly, you know, especially since you're trying to minimize us, you're trying to say that, you know, we're we're just a minor league and, and things like that. 
they wanted to prove that they were a major league and that they were serious, and since the NFL wasn't willing to work with them, then they were going to go against them. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. All right. Well, before we sort of get into 1946 and the first season, I, I do want to let's uh, uh, spend a shine a little bit of a spotlight on probably the most uh, important uh, historically and, and impactful team of this fledgling league. And that's the Cleveland Browns. Um, you want to give a little bit of background right. as to sort of how that came about and perhaps why they became so dominant so early and uh, often, shall we say? Well, I'd say the first thing that uh, you take a look at is uh, is Paul Brown. Um, when Arthur McBride came into that league and, you know, they officially got a franchise, he, he targeted Paul Brown because he knew that Paul Brown was successful in every other place that he was at, you know, whether it was coaching at Massillon High School, whether it was coaching at Great Lakes, um, he was successful everywhere he was at. And so he targeted Paul Brown and he said, this is the person I'm going to have. And once you get someone like a Paul Brown in there, he starts bringing in some of the talent that he had at Great Lakes and that, you know, he knew even back at Massillon as well, bringing that talent in. And you knew you were going to have a strong team when you start having a successful coach there, bringing in star players that uh, he has already coached, he already knew, and he knew that they would be successful at the professional level. Uh, and for you uh, completists out there, we are a stone's throw from the uh, Great Lakes Naval Air Station here in uh, the northern suburbs here of Chicago, where we uh, try to record this show on a, on a regular and consistent basis. Um, so uh, the team name, I, this is really, this is my ignorance. It wasn't named for Brown, was it? You hear some different stories back and forth. It sounds like, from what I could tell, is that it was named after him, and he kind of reluctantly agreed to it. Um, it's not something that he wanted at all, but it does sound like it was named after him. I couldn't find really any specific evidence to the contrary to that. So that's not an official story of it. It's just what I've been able to glean out of the information that I've seen. All right. We put it out there to our, our diligent listeners to inform us about that. That's an interesting story. Again, my naivete, I am not a professional historian. I just play one on whatever the podcast <laughs> uh, but it's it's certainly something I, I've always been intrigued with um, uh, going forward. All right, so let's let's uh, segue into forty six, right? So now it's now it's time we've got the league, we've got the teams, uh, and the first game even almost seemed to be like a harbinger of the league writ large, and and the Browns were part of that first game um, against the what became I guess the somewhat woeful and and oft forgettable Miami Seahawks. Right. Yeah. I mean they had. 
lots of issues going on. It was played, if I remember correctly, it was played during the week. There was uh, issues as far as weather. Um, and, yeah, I mean, as you had mentioned, the, the Miami Seahawks were not a very good team. And so when you take a team that's as strong as the Cleveland Browns and you put them up against a team that really was as bad as the Miami Seahawks, then, uh, yeah, everything pretty much went wrong on, on that game, for especially for Miami. Why do you, why do you think the Browns were so dominant? Obviously, because of Paul Brown's uh, um, uh, you know prowess as a, as a recruiter and as a coach, but um, you know it also probably spoke a bit to the quality or lack thereof of some of the other teams in the league. Yeah, I mean, I would say that to some extent. I mean, there was quality talent, but I think that um, with some of the coaches that they had, um, they weren't as regimented as Paul Brown. I mean, Paul Brown really had a good system in place for how he wanted to coach his teams and how the players were supposed to react and how the players were supposed to conduct themselves. It was, he was truly regimented as far as that's concerned. And I think having that, you know, in place was something that really put him ahead of the other coaches at the time. So like you said, you've got, you know, a quality coach, you've got a regimented system, you've got top quality talent coming in, uh, all of that, I think, you know, really put him ahead of the other teams. Now, I know I've talked to several players who played in both leagues, um, and then I specifically asked them, it's okay, when you talk about the National Football League, the talent that's in the National Football League and the talent that's in the All-America Football Conference, how would you compare it? I mean, which team was, which league was stronger? Every single one of them said that, the AAFC was at least as strong as the NFL, if not stronger. There's only one person that I know of that I've interviewed that said, well, that's true to some extent, but the worst teams in the AAFC were worse than the worst teams in the NFL. But he immediately followed that up and said, but the best teams in the All-America Football Conference were better than the best teams in the NFL. And every single one of them are always referring to the Cleveland Browns saying that, you know, they are so strong. They are such a good team that, you know, they, they would beat any NFL team out there. Um, So, I mean, when you talk about those types of talent, I mean, you would see like a really wide disparity. And I think that's another reason why Cleveland was so dominant because of the fact that, you know, they were so much better than all the other teams. I mean, yeah, in the beginning you had the, the New York Yankees and then, um, as you started getting toward the end of the conference, then you started seeing San Francisco coming up there, Buffalo to some extent. But Cleveland was still was always the best uh, within the, the conference. And every player that I talked to pretty much said that, that they would have beaten any team in the NFL. And they, they pretty much proved that later on, which I imagine we'll be discussing. Well, it, it seems, too, that uh, the crowds were pretty strong for, for some of those more popular teams in the new league. Right? I mean, you mentioned Cleveland. I think San Francisco at the, the old Keysar Stadium uh, drew pretty well. Los Angeles seemed to do pretty well. Uh, and New York seemed to do pretty well. And it also seemed that the NFL itself seemed to do quite well, too. It almost felt like that uh, the competition was, was good for pro football altogether uh, in 46. I would say that, yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the attendance figures, I mean, a lot of it was pretty consistent between the NFL and the All-America Football Conference. I mean, the NFL was already established, so they're going to be, um, they're going to have some more attendance because they've already got that built-in fan base. But people started taking a look at the All-America Football Conference and realizing that, yeah, I mean, we've got some good teams here. We've got some good players. I know a lot of these players because they either played in the NFL or they were stars in college. Um, so, I mean, you start seeing as, as things are going on that, you know, attendance started to grow more, people are getting more interested in it. And, um, they really, you know, kind of evened out with the NFL as far as, you know, getting those, those attendance figures. Well, but, uh, not all was well though, right? So despite that sort of, uh, success at the top, right. And you had some lopsided scores uh, as indicative of, uh, the first game, which we kind of glossed over, but that September 6th, 46, first game between the Browns and the Miami Seahawks. I mean, that the score of that game was 44, nothing in favor of the Browns, uh, perhaps a harbinger. And then obviously Miami, uh, had some issues with some of their home games. I think they had to postpone a couple of games because of bad weather and hurricanes and all that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, there were teams, right. And the league itself, uh, wasn't necessarily, 
uh, doing gangbusters in terms of finances, right? I think uh, based on my research, you had, I think across all of pro football, right? You're talking about what, I guess, 16 teams total across the AAFC and the NFL. Uh, Based on what I can tell, the Browns of the AAFC and the Bears of the NFL seem to be the only ones really, you know, uh, coining a profit, so to speak. So, um, it's clear that that some of the, the 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 parts of the AFC were not necessarily strong, Miami included, and I guess Buffalo as well, right? Because they were called the Bisons, but as they went into forty seven, they they got renamed. I suspect there were some other things going on in Buffalo as well to sort of stabilize that franchise, right? Yeah, I mean it was still the same franchise; it was just a name change. Um, but you know, they started off having a few issues. I mean, Sam Cordovano was the main person back in 1944 that was pushing the franchise with the NFL. And he was involved in the team up until about May of 1946. At that point, he left to uh, just focus strictly on his construction company. And that kind of left them in bad shape. He had a coach come in basically a month before training camp, uh, wasn't involved in any of the uh, selections of players or anything like that. So, I mean, they were kind of put behind the eight ball from the very beginning. But as you start getting into 1947, you now have a full year with the new coach. Um, you have a new general manager in there. Uh, and you, know, you started having a draft, and so they were involved with that. And now Buffalo started becoming a little more stable. Still, 47 wasn't a great year for them, but once you started getting into 48, 49, um, that's when they started becoming a stronger team. And a lot of that was the fact that, you know, in 47, they got George Raderman as their quarterback. Uh, so you combine him with Chet Mutrin and Alton Baldwin at, you know, at the end position. And they really started to put together a pretty good team. But yeah, I mean, with the instability at the very beginning in 46, uh, they kind of struggled a little bit. And even looking at the very end, you know, the, the owner was saying that, you know, he was struggling financially, and that was pretty much, you know, indicative of a lot of the teams. As you mentioned, the NFL was struggling. The uh, All-American Football Conference teams were struggling. You know, Miami and Chicago were definitely uh, probably tops of the list of not doing well. So, um, yeah, I think a little bit of that instability in Buffalo was uh, mitigated once uh, uh, the coach, Red Dawson, was able to stay there for at least a year and start putting his plan in place. Well, going into 47, you also had another interesting move, right? You had the commissioner basically uh, uh, jumping fences and getting into an actual team ownership and uh, uh, with the Rockets to kind of stabilize that franchise. I mean, you know, that's that seems like a, a bit of instability in going into your second year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you have a, a team that's struggling like Chicago, I mean, they definitely want to do what they could to try to stabilize those lower teams. Chicago being one of them, Miami basically folded after the first year. So uh, they were no longer in the picture. So they needed to focus on Chicago. And so the commissioner stepped down from being the commissioner and then went over to become a a part owner uh, of the Chicago team. Also was doing some coaching while he was there, um, hoping to try to bring that together. The league itself was, looking at ways that they could, you know, share talent among the teams. And so basically um, teams like Cleveland and New York had to give up some of their players to the the lesser teams in order to try to improve them and create more parity within the league. So we had multiple things going on to try to stabilize things. And uh, ultimately, you know, Chicago still had issues, but, you know, they were able to at least improve them a little bit by some of the things that they were doing back um, as early as 47. It seems like that. It seems like that in '47, though, it was sort of a gangbusters year. I mean, in terms of the turnstiles, it seems like there were some just eye popping crowds uh, for for some of these games in '47. It just seemed like there was a lot of wind behind the sales of the of the uh, of the AAFC. I mean, you know, eighty two thousand of the Coliseum for a Yankees Don's game, right? I mean, that's 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 just, that's that's amazing, especially for a league that's only a year plus old. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it was that. In 46, they had proved that they could put out good quality football. And yeah, there were some teams that struggled a little bit, like the Miamis and Chicago's, but you still had good teams there. The Browns, you had the the Yankees, you had the, the Dons, and to some extent the, the 49ers as well. I mean, you had some good teams that could put together some good games, and people were realizing that, hey, you know, there's, they have a lot of talent here. They're 
putting out some good games. This is exciting to watch. And so, yeah, I mean, you're, you definitely see the attendance growing as you're getting to 47, 48, and people are really getting interested in this competitor to the NFL. The NFL isn't the only game in town that you've got other people that you can watch. And I, and I and perhaps more pointedly, uh, it seemed like the Yankees in New York and the Dons in Los Angeles were uh, outpacing or, or, or certainly giving a, a solid run and not, in some cases even outdrawing their NFL counterparts, right, in two major key markets. Yeah, and that's you know one of the reasons why you know they they wanted to make sure they were in those markets to show that they could compete. And they were obviously you know when you look at the attendance, they were successful in that. You put out good quality football, and people are going to go out there and watch it. And so they definitely proved that by putting teams in those franchises, that was a good move for the All America Football Conference. And probably one of the reasons why it was at least able to sustain itself for those four years that it was in existence. Yeah, so it seems that in 47 and, and certainly in 48 even more so that, that there seemed to be sort of this sort of, uh, I guess, Mendoza line between the haves and the have-nots or the, the quality, stable, uh, drawing, and maybe financially at least viable uh, teams and those that weren't, right? So in the, in the AAFC, I mean, it looks like clearly Cleveland was, you know, uh, was superior. You had the Yankees in New York, uh, the 49ers largely unchallenged in San Francisco, the Dons in L.A. doing more than their share to sort of uh, – compete and in some cases even best uh, what the Rams were doing and the Bills, right, with their own market in Buffalo with no real competition. But then it seems like the rest of the league, you know, uh, whether it be the new Baltimore franchise or the Brooklyn Dodgers or certainly the Chicago Rockets, um, were struggling. And it seemed like that that was kind of a, uh, a theme for the rest of the league's existence, sort of these haves, if you will, and and those that weren't doing so strongly and, and maybe even kind of set the tone for what a, I don't know, a relationship and or something with the NFL might look like down the road. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, we had touched on it briefly before when I talked about the players saying that, you know, the best teams in the All-American Football Conference were better than the best teams in the NFL and the worst teams were worse than the worst teams in the NFL. So it really shows you how much of a gap that there was between the top teams and the worst teams within the All-American Football Conference. I think that's, you know, something that they really struggled with and something that they tried to do what they could to improve it, uh, improve that situation so they'd have more parity, taking players from the uh, stronger teams and giving them to the weaker teams. Uh, the draft concept where the worst teams draft first, the best teams draft last, uh, giving extra draft picks to the worst teams, things like that. So, I mean, they did what they could to try to do that, but I mean, when you have teams like the Cleveland Browns that were just so much better than everybody else, um, it, it made it tough. And then you got those second tier ones, the, the New Yorks, the Los Angeles, the San Francisco's. Um, and then, you know, Buffalo is like right there in the middle. So, you know, they could go either way, you know, one game, one way or another would, you know, definitely um, show whether they're one of the top teams or one of the worst teams. So having them right in the middle, I mean, was kind of good because then, you know, you had that parity, but you still had that difference between the Clevelands and say like the, the Chicago's of that conference. And um, they just were never able to get enough parity in there to, I guess, essentially make the conference sustainable um, because of you know, the lack of competition. All right. Well, let's 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 segue to 48, because I think in my mind, again, I'm an amateur historian. You're the pro. OK, it seems like 48 uh, is kind of almost the sort of seminal uh, uh, divining rod or, or, or drama point here for the future of what this league would be and, and what was to come thereafter. And I think there are two in my mind, again, as amateur uh, points that sort of stand out. I mean, one is on the field, you had. The Cleveland Browns, again, with their superiority, with something that had really never been done before in pro football and hadn't and wasn't really repeated until the early 70s with the Miami Dolphins. And that was a perfect season, right? Undefeated. Right. Yeah. To try to put that into context, they went, if I remember correctly, 29 straight games without a defeat. So started in the 1947 season, you lose one game that entire season you go on and win the championship coming off of another championship season in 46. You go the entire 1948 season and win a championship. 
And then you go in 1949, only lose one game and win the championship. I mean, try to think about a team nowadays being able to accomplish something like that. You have teams as strong as the Patriots, they couldn't do it. You have teams like the, the Steelers of the 70s, 49ers back in the 80s, the Cowboys of the 90s. Nobody even came close to being able to do that. I mean, yeah, you had the Patriots going 16 games and then losing in the Super Bowl, but even the 72 Dolphins, I mean, they they played well in 71, obviously had the perfect season in 72, played well in 73, but they're still not at the same level of what Cleveland was able to accomplish. And even if you look at all four uh, years that they were in the conference, they won more championships than they lost games. I mean, you know, to, that's you know, to me the definition of a dynasty is somebody that is able to do that. And then even when you take it into the NFL, 10 straight championship games, winning seven of them. I mean, that's a, something that I don't see anybody ever being able to match that. So really being able to look at that in context really shows you how dominant they were and how strong of a team they were because they were able to even continue that as they got into the NFL. So you can't just say, well, they just went against an inferior talent. They did in the NFL as well. So Yeah, and, and I got to think that's a hot point of contention amongst pro football historians, right, about, say, the 1972 Miami Dolphins NFL team, right, and their perfect record, mm-hmm. right, which is lauded and everybody remembers it. And it's certainly a great feat. And again, proving to your point, hard to do. But you could make the argument, as I'm sure some of your professional uh, historian uh, compatriots would say, that that still somehow compares not as well to what you just described the Browns uh, uh, term was in the in the 40s. Right. And, you know, to me, that's why, you know, I'm not happy when the fact that, you know, they say the 72 Dolphins are the only ones who ever accomplished that. Well, no, they're not. They're the second ones to have accomplished it. And you, then, you know, you start hearing the qualifiers. Well, they're the only ones who did it in the Super Bowl era, as if, you know, pro football didn't exist before the Super Bowl. So to ignore a team like the Cleveland Browns, who was able to accomplish what they accomplished, even if you want to try to negate it a little bit and say that it's on par with the 72 Dolphins, still, the Browns were the first ones to do that. And, you know, they were a dynasty back then. So, I mean, the Browns really deserve credit for what they were able to accomplish. And nowadays, it seems like nobody even knows it existed. And if they do, it's like, yeah, yeah so what? It was back then. Who cares? And, so, and, I mean, and that's something I really want to, to come out of this is, you know, they were, you know, a dominant team. They did something that nobody else was ever able to accomplish until the 72 Dolphins. And to me, if you look at everything in totality, I put them ahead of the 72 Dolphins as far as what they were able to accomplish. And and this is why we do this this show uh, for various reasons. But but one of them is to to sort of to highlight things that for whatever reason are glossed over or. You know, these kids today with their, uh, you know, they think that the history was invented uh, only in their generation. Um, But Mm -hmm. the other major sort of thing in 48, right, besides that, uh, which is a huge issue, right, a huge, uh, uh, you know, point in uh, in this curve. uh, It seems that there is a the there is a a war for talent. Uh, It is a a costly one. And it also seems that uh, the cooler heads, perhaps in the back rooms of both leagues, uh, started to recognize that there needed to be some kind of combination or merger or something uh, relatively soon, or both would maybe not necessarily uh, come out well. Is that a fair ass- assessment? I would say that. I mean, from the very beginning, the uh, AAFC wanted to have sort of their own Super Bowl, quote unquote, uh, with the NFL. Now, they wanted to have the champion of the AAFC go against the champion of the NFL so that they could see you know, who was going to be the winner on that. Well, there's no way the NFL was going to do that because there's too much of a potential of the Browns coming in and kind of embarrassing whatever NFL team that they um, won the league that year. So they were always trying to minimize things. They didn't want anything to do with the All-America Football Conference, but like you said, you know, they realized that 
there's no way that this was sustainable. I mean, the NFL was losing money. The All-American Football Conference was losing money. So it's just going to, you know, who had more money to toss into it? And the All-American Football Conference had more money. So they would, if, you know, if it came down to it, the All-American Football Conference would win that type of a battle. So the NFL knew that they had to do something. So, you know, behind closed doors, starting around 48, so into, into 49 is when they started having discussions of how they could bring these two leagues together to, to end this war and try to keep it so that both leagues don't go under, that you know, one league would sustain itself and they'd be able to move forward. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they definitely started around 48 to, to have those discussions. And uh, the biggest contentions were, you know, how would they handle merging these two leagues together? Uh, they only wanted two teams coming in. Um, eventually, they were talking about a third, then they were talking about which teams would come in. Uh, George Preston Marshall, who was the owner of the Washington Redskins, definitely did not want Baltimore coming in because of the, um, the, the rivalry, the competitiveness, you know, being in the same market. He figured that he would, uh, he would end up losing out on revenue, that they'd be splitting the fans. So he definitely didn't want Baltimore coming in. But then, you know, you look, you got Cleveland, you got San Francisco, so the two of the stronger teams coming in. So they weren't um, having as much of an issue with that. Buffalo definitely wanted to come in and they were considering bringing Buffalo in. Um, But I imagine we'll be talking about that in a little bit as far as why they didn't come in. So yeah, those discussions started in 48 and then continued into 49 um, because they knew that there was no way that they could get around not trying to have some sort of murder between these two leagues. Well, let's let's talk about that now. Why why were the Bills uh, effectively in the running and then maybe got snubbed sort of at the end? A couple of reasons. One is the owner, Jim Brule, uh, decided that he was no longer interested in having a football team, at least being the, the sole owner of a football team. So he said he was definitely out. So then a community group came in and said, OK, now we're going to put this team out together you now. As a, as a group here, and then we're going to, you know, work with the league in order to get Buffalo into the National Football League. So working with the NFL commissioner, Burt Bell, um, they were able to move along in the process. And, you know, Burt Bell says, okay, well, you know, you've got everything that, that we're looking for. I mean, some were saying, okay, it's a small market, so maybe it's not going to be as financially viable, but, you know, they're still going to listen to the case of Buffalo. Uh, what it really came down to in the end was that teams were looking for a schedule to be put out saying, okay, now when are we going to be meeting with Buffalo? How, when is Buffalo going to be meeting with us? Now, how are things going to be worked out? And Burt Bell never put that schedule together. He promised Buffalo that he was going to do that before the meetings. He never did that for whatever reason. And so as a result, the, uh, the NFL owner said, no, we're not going to have Buffalo coming in because we don't know um, how this is going to work out and uh, when we're playing them and schedules and, and stuff like that. So there's nothing I've been able to find as far as why Burt Bell never did what he promised he was going to do, whether he purposely didn't want them to come in, whether he forgot, whether it's just something he didn't want to do, I'm not sure. I haven't been able to find any information, but that was the the main reason why Buffalo wasn't going to come in because they had tossed out other things of like, oh, well, it snows a lot in Buffalo. It's like, well, it snows a lot in Chicago too. So and you, you have teams there. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of excuses that they tried to come up with, but when it came down to the final vote, it was there was no schedule produced with Buffalo on that schedule. And so the owners voted it down as far as having Buffalo come into the league. You think it would have been different had the ownership been more stable or, or he had decided to keep the team and then not have to sort of get out of football? I, I'm really curious as to the reasons why he would want to get out, especially if there were some hints that the NFL and a merger of some sort would, would come into being, right? Or was the were the losses or the instability, I don't know, any of the reasons as to why he would sort of cede control of a team to a community to, you know, because that doesn't that doesn't. That doesn't give off the appearance of stability, right? No, I mean, it's basically because um, he was losing money pretty much every year that he was in the league. Um, and so he didn't want to continue losing money. And so he basically just said, I'm done. 
Um, this was before, you know, any community group stepped forward. This was before, you know, really pushing to try to get into the NFL. Uh, he basically said, you know, I have no interest in continuing as an owner. He did become you know, a minority owner in the Browns, but, you know, it really wasn't that much of a consequence for him to be able to do that. I mean, he really didn't have to worry about, you know, running the franchise. He was just a, a very small owner within the Browns. So that vacuum is what created this community group that came together to try to get into the National Football League. They knew that there was going to be a merger. They wanted the Bills to come across into the National Football League. And so that community group took the took charge of it and tried to push it forward. Like you said, because of the fact that there wasn't a single owner, um, the NFL wasn't happy with that. Um, he, he, we know right now in the, the constitution of the NFL, you have to have one person or essentially, you know, one spokesperson for an NFL team in order to be considered for a franchise. Green Bay, you know, is publicly owned, but they're kind of grandfathered into that. But that's one of the reasons why um, some of the owners were against Buffalo coming in is because they didn't have that single person that could make decisions and speak on behalf of the, the franchise without having to talk to other members of a, a board of directors or community group or something like that. There wasn't that one person to make that decision. Very interesting. And in hindsight, right, you, you wonder what would have happened had that uh, uh, not happened and Buffalo could have been in the league a lot earlier uh, than the subsequent incarnation of the Bills uh, later on in the NFL. Very, That's a very interesting story. Um, and I remind our listeners that uh, you want to get more deep on that particular angle of this discussion. Uh, Ken Crippen uh, wrote the book, The Original Buffalo Bills uh, History uh, in the AAFC. Uh, that book is available via McFarland. Uh, publishers. And um, uh, perhaps it's an own separate uh, episode at some point. We can get more granular on that. Uh, it's just an intriguing story. You wonder what some of the, the personalities involved uh, were related to that. But before we go back to that, I, before we get to 49 and the sort of the beginning of the end, so to speak, um, I think it's really important. It seems that, you know, uh, in 48, you had uh, actually the third now new commissioner uh, coming into the AAFC, this guy named uh, Kessing, I believe it was Oliver Kessing, another uh, uh, military admiral guy. Um, mm. And uh, it also seemed to me that uh, uh, Ward, uh, who is still obviously part of uh, the league, having founded it, um, uh, Arch Ward, uh, you know, was still up to some interesting promotional and or, um, I don't know, uh, machinations, if you will, to to make some stuff happen. I. Yeah, and I think perhaps you talk about this in the uh, in your uh, uh, in some of the Buffalo uh, work you've done, and, and maybe in the book to come. Um, but my understanding was that Ward tried to kind of steal uh, the relationship that the NFL had with his original college All Star game and bring it to the AAFC, and that in some respects was almost sort of a a pivotal and public event that maybe hastened uh, the merger talks uh, that much further. Yeah, I mean, I would say that that probably uh, was another reason why, along with all the financial difficulties, um, you know, Ward was involved with that from the, the very beginning, that all-star game. And yeah, I mean, there's no reason for it to continue with the NFL if he's got his own conference. And so, you know, he definitely wanted to to bring the notoriety and the, the game to the All-America Football Conference. And like you said, that pretty much uh, scared the NFL and you know, was yet another reason for them to say, hey, maybe we need to uh, try to find some sort of peace between these two leagues and, and get, this, um, get this hammered out because there's no way that we're going to be able to sustain itself between stealing the, the players from the National Football League. I mean, they stole a franchise from the National Football League, and then now they're trying to take the All-Star game away. Uh, there's just way too much going on that uh, – they needed to to start talking as far as you know, how can we end this war between these two leagues? Yeah, I think it's important for for our audience to recognize too uh, that you know in the late forties the uh, we talked about it or hinted at it before. I mean, the college football game was very very strong, and, and in some cases even stronger than what professional football was putting out there. Uh, certainly not like the uh, uh, you know the 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 the, uh, the heft that the NFL has today. Obviously, the college game is still very strong here in modern days, but. The college game was really, in many respects, almost looked upon as the almost superior product, and, and, and the professionals were just sort of getting 
to that level and then some. And that this college all-star game actually was a pretty big deal because you had literally, at least as it was set up, the idea that the best of the very powerful college game uh, against the very best of supposedly the professionals that in the NFL. So, you know, stealing or or or. Uh, changing ties of this game, Ward being the the birth uh, uh, person of it, uh, to another league. It was it was not an insubstantial uh, uh, deal if it were to happen. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, to give a little perspective, you know, if you go back to the beginning of professional football back in the eighteen hundreds, I mean, any time that you have somebody that is a professional football player, that was frowned upon back then. Basically, yeah, everybody needs to be pure amateurs, and you're, you know, you're ruining the game by being a professional. And so, the college game was always far superior in people's minds. Um, now you start getting into, you know, the beginning of the NFL. Same thing. I mean, a lot of people, you know, through the 1910s and 19, even into the 1920s, a little bit, would play under assumed names because one, they didn't want to lose their amateur status. And two is they didn't want people to know that they were playing professional football because it was more frowned upon than the college game was. So, yeah, I mean, like you had said, the college game was king and professional was definitely a step down from that. And so now you get into the 1940s, professional football is you know gaining ground, but uh, the college game is still superior to it. And to be able to play against the college teams, the college, you know, the all-stars essentially of college, that was very important to a professional because that the professionals can play on the same level as, as the college players. And it helps the college players to say, that, hey, you know, we were playing on the same level as the best in the professional ranks. So that was huge to have that type of a game and to potentially lose that was, was going to be something that would be critical. Well, that sets the tone for 49, and we're getting sort of near the end of the of the of the league and the story here. But um, you mentioned the financial problems. I think it's really important to to highlight that uh, there was some, um, shall we say, subsidization of some of the teams in the AAFC. Uh, in particular, it seems that uh, the Don's owner uh, Lindemeyer was uh, helping, maybe publicly or probably more privately, keeping the Colts and the Chicago Hornets kind of alive. Uh, as uh, as the 49 season came about, um, probably not uh, not a not a sign of strength, right? That would be correct, and it wasn't just Los Angeles doing that. I mean, I did see that Buffalo helped out as well, and there were probably other teams. I wouldn't be surprised if Cleveland and San Francisco helped out, possibly uh, possibly New York too. But uh, I know definitely Buffalo also helped out with trying to keep uh, some of these teams afloat because Chicago was struggling mightily. Baltimore was struggling mightily. They just couldn't compete, um, not only on the football field, but also financially. And it was critical for the league to keep these teams afloat because, you know, you start seeing the the teams drop and, you know, people are going to say, well, okay, well, this conference really isn't as strong as it used to be or what we thought it was. And so that would naturally just make the All-America Football Conference dissolve and the NFL would end up taking back over again as the sole professional league, or at least major league professional teams. So, yeah, I mean, there was definitely a lot of financial help going on, but the same thing was going on in the NFL, too. I mean, there were teams that were really struggling, and so you had other teams helping out to try to to keep the entire league afloat as they were going through this war with the All-America Football Conference. All right. Well, history shows that two days before the final game of the AAFC uh, 1949 season, which ultimately wound up becoming the last game of the AAFC's uh, existence, uh, a merger. uh, Don't call it a merger. Right. An agreement was was made between the AAFC and the NFL uh, for for combining uh, these two leagues in some way, shape or form. Um, Do you have any insight or any intrigue as to sort of like what the, the 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 dynamics of 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 how it finally came to be in those latter days before it was announced, or um, was it just sort of a culmination of conversations that had been going on during the course of the season, as far as you can tell? It was a it was a culmination of conversations. I mean, they finally came to an agreement, like you said at the very end there. But uh, the biggest fight I think they were having was you know how they were going to accomplish this. There's no way they're going to bring all the teams over. They just weren't going to be able to sustain that. So 
you know, what teams come over? I mean, Cleveland was the obvious choice they would bring over. San Francisco was one that they were going to bring over. Um, but then they're looking at, you know, Baltimore coming over, looking at Buffalo coming over. Um, so a lot of that was just based off of, you know, what are they going to do uh, as far as what franchises are going to come over and then what are they going to do with the players themselves? So they ended up agreeing that uh, essentially by bribing George Marshall, George Preston Marshall, um, giving him a bunch of money, uh, he suddenly agreed to bring Baltimore in um, after he received that big check. So that's pretty much solidified, you know, who the third team was going to be that was coming into that league. And then we had already talked about Buffalo, uh, what was going on with them as far as why they ended up not coming into the league. So once they figured out exactly what teams were going to be there, then they had to settle on you know, how they were going to allocate the players uh, from the all American football conference into the NFL. So uh, I think it's a little interesting that, you know, the NFL spent so much time talking about, you know, how bad the league was and it was just a minor league and you know, there's, there's no consequence to it. But when it came down to it, they jumped at the fact of trying to get all of this talent out of the all American football conference. They wanted all the players and distributed among all the teams. So um, to me, that was, that was an interesting story. So they ended up coming out with an allocation draft uh, as far as teams going through a draft style system in order to, take players from um, all of the teams within the All-America Football Conference. Based on your research, um, do you have any idea as to when this, don't call it a merger, uh, was kind of assumed to be a fait accompli? Like, uh, like at what point was it just a matter of this is going to happen and we just need to go negotiate terms versus, you know, this is, this is not going to happen, right? What Was it that all-star you know, the uh, grab by Ward, or his, his attempt, was that the straw that broke the camel's back? Or or I'm just curious as to when both sides kind of just realized and like when maybe was it during the 49 season? Was it before then? I, I, I'm wondering, I just, you know, you may not have the answer, but I'm just curious as to when they kind of both recognized that we got to negotiate terms versus the debate. Yeah, I would. My guess would be that it would be sometime during the 49 season. Um, they had already started the talks in 48, but I think by the time they got to the 49 season, the culmination of everything is what really showed the NFL that, yeah, we, we really need to get this done. We can't sustain it. And going into a 1950 season with everything the way that it is and the way that things are going definitely was not going to be good for anybody. So I would say somewhere in the 49 season is when they really uh, – realized that this had to get done and it had to get done before they started the 1950 season. Okay. Uh, we're almost near the end here. So thank you for, for hanging on with me. So then this happens, the, uh, the, uh, the Browns, the 49ers and the Colts are, are basically accepted into, I guess what was called the, at the, at the for a short period of time, the uh, national American football league, but that was obviously quickly changed to back to the NFL. Um, in 1950, even before the season began, you had a preseason game. It seemed like that this was the sort of harbinger of a bunch of things, of the Super Bowl being it. But this matchup, I guess, preseason, though, between the Browns, the champions of the old AAFC, and the Philadelphia Eagles, um, I guess they call it the World Series of Pro Football. Um, it seems like it was a real uh, good promotional uh, uh, ushering in, I guess, of the new NFL. Yeah, and I think it was more of the NFL wanting to make a statement to prove that, okay, we have no choice but to compete against you, so why don't we start off with this and we'll show you how much better the, the NFL is over the All-American Football Conference. You know, now that you're going against quality talent, quote-unquote, versus what you did in the All-American Football Conference. And what happened? Fortunately, it didn't go the way, uh, it didn't go the, way the NFL wanted. Um, Cleveland... Uh, had no trouble beating the Philadelphia Eagles, um, two time NFL champions, Philadelphia Eagles and, uh, Cleveland had no trouble beating them. So, um, the Eagles and the NFL obviously were not happy with this and made a few comments about, uh, you know, all the passing and stuff that, uh, the Cleveland did. Um, so you get into the second game that they played that year and, 
according to the play-by-play, there were no passes thrown at all in that game. Um, there were actually two passes. This is something that, uh, you know, is a, a myth that no passes were thrown, but um, the box score says that. But officially they did throw two passes, but uh, one of them was negated on a penalty and trying to remember the, the second one, why that was not counted. It may have been a penalty as well. But um, Cleveland basically just ran the entire game, and they still beat them again. So it wasn't just a fluke that they beat the Eagles the first time. They went in and they beat them again and uh, showed that Cleveland was as strong as they were built. I mean, they are definitely the, the champions of the All-American Football Conference, and they were definitely the best team in professional football. And they proved it on the field not once but twice. And, and again, this is really interesting, the whole parallel to what the 1960s AFL went through. I mean, it almost feels like this was the Old Testament to the AFL's New Testament, uh, you know, a, a couple of decades later. It's just it's it's very, very interesting to see how the commonalities and the similarities of, of that um, and the Super Bowl that yeah, came out of that. You can go back to the uh, the first AFL back in 1926. Same type of thing, competing against the NFL. NFL would dismiss them. NFL and the AFL both struggle against each other financially. Teams are you know, going bankrupt. Um, so they ended up having to, to end that quickly, too, in order to make sure that uh, the league could sustain itself. So, yeah, the All-America Football Conference was the second time they had to do that, and the AFL in the 60s was the third time they had to do that. Uh, Ken, this has been great. Uh, one, I sort of want to end on one sort of uh, a big issue, and that's sort of the uh, the legacy and or aftermath of the AAFC, right? Because there were clearly a bunch of things uh, that emanated out of of this challenger league that um, not only last today, but, um, you know, frankly, are uh, maybe forgotten and in terms of their contribution uh, to pro football. I mean, I think one of which which we really didn't even talk about. Um, but I want to get some other things in a second, uh, is the idea of uh, racial integration, right? Where it seemed like the Cleveland Browns in particular, but the league generally, uh, seemed to break the color barrier uh, uh, pretty early on in its existence. Uh, and, and only later did it kind of rever- reverberate into uh, the NFL, et cetera. But I think the uh, historians maybe don't sort of uh, give much credit or, or um, attention to some of the 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 discrimination uh, barriers that were broken by some of the AAFC's uh, teams and, uh, and rosters. Yeah. And I think one thing that kind of gets lost in that too, I don't know who signed contracts first, whether it's, you know, Kenny Washington, whether it's Mary Motley, Bill Willis or Woody Strode, um, who signed them first. But um, the thing that you want to take a look at is that Paul Brown voluntarily brought in Bill Willis and Mary and Motley. It wasn't forced on him, whereas Dan Reeves, he was forced to integrate, and that's because of being at the L.A. Coliseum. They told him that, you know, you need to start integrating your team. And so his hands were tied. He had to do it. He didn't do it voluntarily, whereas you take someone like Paul Brown. To me, he was completely colorblind. He couldn't care less what color skin you had. He wanted the best players, and so that's what he did. And so I think that's one thing that kind of gets lost a little bit in the history of the reintegration in 1946 um, that really, you know, Paul Byron deserves credit for being able to do that, that he didn't care. He, he did what uh, he thought was best for his team, which was bringing in the best players. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably like to spend more time delving into that uh, in some other episodes and other things. We, we did touch upon that particular issue uh, with the Rams, uh, with Jim Selecki in a previous uh, episode. But that's a very important and interesting distinction about sort of the voluntarily oriented uh, uh, approach of Brown versus the sort of more, I guess, mandatory or expedient uh, approach of Mr. Reeves with uh, with his team in L.A. But um, in addition to that, though, some other, I guess, more uh, on the field and or uh, operational or, or game uh, improving uh, innovations that sort of came about from the AAFC. No. Yeah, I mean, you definitely um, you had the messenger guard system that Paul Brown was using as far as bringing plays in uh, into the game itself, um, as far as doing the helmet communications. Uh, he was the first person that did that. Uh, he's also you know, spent a lot of time doing film study and really studying the game, studying opponents, things like that, things that 
weren't really done, especially done at a high level. Um, so, I mean, you, you definitely have, you know, some innovations coming out of there. Um, you talk about, you know, the number of games per season. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that you can definitely credit with the all America football conference. And a lot of that goes back to, uh, to Paul Brown and what he did with his team. Uh, and uh, last point, I guess, is that uh, this wasn't officially a merger, right? But um, I, I guess there's a point, for, I guess, from historians' perspective about the records, right? So the AFC records are not officially in the NFL records. Is that true? Although the, the Pro Football Hall of Fame does recognize the league. Is there sort of a contention about sort of the records and the transfer of them into NFL, uh, you know, NFL annals? Yeah, actually, there is. Um, basically, yeah, the NFL didn't want it to really be a merger. It was more of an absorption of three of the teams. And that's the, the way that they looked at it. But as far as the official records, they're, what they officially say is that because we never received the official statistics from the All-America Football Conference, we're not going to incorporate it into, into NFL statistics. And that was their story. So um, the actual official score sheets were lost for a long period of time. Uh, they were found basically in a dumpster and, uh, one person was able to get them out of the dumpster and brought them into his home. Um, I think it was probably about, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago, something like that. I worked with a few other people to, uh, to help get those out into the public. So right now we had, uh, some people purchased those from the person who had them, and I own a copy of them, and two other people own a copy of them, one of those being um, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So the official score sheets that do exist, and they are not 100% complete, but the ones that do exist um, are out in the public now. And we have gone back uh, in this new book that's coming out on the All-America Football Conference, uh, we've gone through and we've updated all of the statistics because the ones that were published previously, there were some inaccuracies in there. So this new book does have all of those statistics corrected, um, as well as coaching records being corrected. So um, those stats are now out there, but because they're not 100% official, because not all of them exist, I mean, we interpol interpolated what was missing. But since there's not a complete set of score sheets out there, I doubt the NFL is ever going to consider the All-America Football Conference statistics official and will bring them into the NFL. It seems to me, though, that you have a little bit of a crusade, though, that could possibly still make that happen, though, right? Yeah, I mean, we're, we always try to do that. Uh, really, it's up to one company that uh, runs all the statistics for the NFL. If they accept them, uh, then they will be brought in. But a lot of the work that we've done with them, they've been reluctant to make any changes to any statistics. Uh, even if you've got proof, even if you show them what, uh, what's out there, a lot of times they still won't correct any of those statistics. And so as a result, um, it's definitely an uphill battle to try to get uh, AAFC statistics being put into the official records, especially if you've got a couple of score sheets that are missing. That's that's very interesting, considering that, uh, by my count, 15 players in the Professional Hall uh, Football Hall of Fame uh, either exclusively or partially had AAFC uh, uh, playing or, or coaching or, or some involvement. And, um, you know, you've got two uh, legacy teams that uh, directly trace uh, their their heritage, the uh, San Francisco 49ers and uh, I guess the. Uh, Baltimore Ravens, or at least by association, the current Cleveland Browns by name only, uh, that trace their roots back to the AAFC. So you'd think that uh, cooler heads should prevail, knowing that uh, that this was such an instrumental component to at least one branch of the current NFL's uh, existence. Yeah, but then you also look at it, too, from the NFL perspective, is maybe still yet another way that they're doing to say that this was a minor league and didn't compete against the NFL on the same level. and that they're not going to they're not going to recognize their accomplishments. Well, uh, I'm sure more debates to come. But um, so Ken Crippen, thank you so much. This has been uh, a fascinating uh, delve and probably a little longer than you would even wanted. But 
Uh, I want to remind our um, our listeners that uh, we've been talking about the All-America Football Conference, and Ken is probably the uh, national authority on uh, on the AAFC uh, and two books, one of which is out there today and been out there for a little while called The Original Buffalo Bills, A History of the All-America Football Conference Team. Uh, and that is published by McFarland. And uh, interestingly, uh, with his colleague, Matt Reeser, the uh, upcoming uh, tome called the All-America Football Conference, uh, which is uh, players, coaches, records, games and awards. I think it's going to be the ultimate resource for uh, All-America Football Conference uh, uh, aficionados. Uh, that comes out, I believe, in September and can be pre-ordered. Is that correct? Uh, also published by McFarland. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, this has been awesome, Ken. I, I appreciate this. Uh, this is uh, uh, another reason why we do these uh, conversations. Uh, lots of history, lots of stories. I, I, there's so much more we need to get to talk talk about, but I suspect there's a lot more to unpack about maybe some of the individual teams and the 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 follies, perhaps, of the Rockets or the. Uh, the ascendance of the of the the Dons in Los Angeles, and hopefully there'll be uh, other conversations and stories to have about uh, the All America Football League, its uh, its legacy, but also sort of the uh, the specifics of some of the things that uh, happened during the late '40s uh, in professional football. My thank you, my th- my thank you, thank you, and my thanks. <laughs> Same thing uh, to well, Ken. Thanks. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for having me, and thank you for what you do as far as getting these uh, little known. Uh, facts of history out there so that uh, people know the, the stories of what really happened uh, back in the history of the game. Now, we are just getting started and uh, uh, anecdotes and uh, and uh, unearthed uh, stories and histories. That's kind of what we're all about. We don't know why we pursue it, but we do. And um, we thank you for being part of it, Ken, very much. OK, my thanks to Ken Crippen for uh, a very interesting conversation around the All-America Football Conference. Uh, A reminder that uh, Ken's uh, current uh, book is called The Original Buffalo Bills, A History of the All-America Football Conference Team. Uh, That is available right now from McFarland, either on our website or wherever else you find good books. Uh, And of course, the book that is to come out in uh, September and is now available for pre-order from McFarland is called The All-America Football Conference, Players, Coaches, Records, Games and Awards. It is the uh, treasure trove of all things uh, AAFC, and that uh, again comes out in September. Uh, that's Ken Crippen with his uh, co author Matt Reeser. Again, available for pre order wherever you do such things. Um, also, want to uh, tell you that Ken can be followed on Twitter at Ken Crippen, C R I P P E N. Uh, and as you know, Ken is the president of the Professional Football uh, Researchers Association, or PFRA. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter. At Football History is their uh, their Twitter handle, uh, and you can also find them on their website at profootballresearchers.org uh, for all kinds of fun uh, information about the history of pro football, including a really cool publication called The Coffin Corner, uh, which uh, I encourage you to subscribe to, and, uh, and you'll learn a lot, as I often do. Um, and frankly, one of the one of the things I want to find out, uh, and I didn't get to ask Ken, I don't know if he knows the answer to it. I suspect one or more of our listeners might. But we talked about the Los Angeles Dons of the AAFC. And um, we know that uh, one of the co-owners uh, of that team back in the 40s was uh, actor extraordinaire uh, and um, uh, uh, quite the uh, quite the sensation back in the day is Don Amici. And I'm just wondering if uh, Don had some influence on the naming of the team, the Los Angeles Dons. Uh, it's a question. It's an imponderable. And I'd love to hear the answer to it. Maybe we'll find out someday, somehow, uh, as we move along in our little journey together here on the podcast. Uh, a reminder about said podcast, uh, as if you need it again, uh, our website for all things that you want to know about the show, as well as interact with us, uh, send us notes, uh, subscribe to our email newsletter. You want to find a book or whatever. It's all there at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, please visit there early and often. Uh, you can also, of course, keep in touch with us uh, via social media. And in particular on Twitter, that's at Good Seats Still. That's where you find us there. You'll find us uh, on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. And you will also find us on Facebook, uh, a whole page devoted to the Good Seats Still Available podcast there as well. Uh, my name is Tim Hanlon. I appreciate your thinking of me uh, when you uh, consider your podcasts to download and listen to. And I look forward to uh, sharing many, many more episodes with you. Uh, in the weeks and months to come. Until then, take care and we'll talk to you soon.